When you Google the word superstition, you get a couple definitions, but taken together they involve the idea of a widely held, overly credulous belief in an incorrect causation for something out in the world. It's easy to think of simple superstitions like how it's bad luck to walk under a ladder, or that hanging a certain kind of talisman in your house or on your neck gives you protection. But there are other kinds of superstitions as well, some that may not seem like they are at first glance. How about the idea that economic prosperity comes best through healthy competition? That reducing the limits upon individual people lets them truly act in their own self-interest and those self-interested pursuits ultimately lead to greater wealth for everyone. Back to that in a moment. In the 1600s, Sir Francis Bacon wrote an essay on superstition. In it, he describes what superstition looks like from the outside. In all superstition, wise men follow fools, and arguments are fitted to practice in a reversed order. What Bacon is saying is that superstition represents an inversion of reality, of logic. In superstition, people lay aside their suspicion to follow those whom they ought to suspect. And instead of thinking critically about their own conditions and re-examining their world, people form their arguments in order to better rationalize what they already do, the way they already see the world. To me, this sounds a lot like ideology. Ideology is the subject of a bunch of social and critical theories, so there are many definitions out there, but one way to think of ideology is the working of ideas, some of them false, others merely distorted, still others having nothing to do with truth, that together help to legitimate a dominant paradigm. This working of ideas produces in most of us some sort of belief. A belief in, say, the way capitalism is supposed to work. The inversion described by Bacon is a good way of beginning to think about the ideology that arises out of capitalism, because as critic Terry Eagleton conveys it in his book on ideology, there is, in a way, a real inversion to begin with. A duplicity that, by the very nature of the system, conceals itself from us. This will be a huge boiling down, but bear with me. First, there is the real inversion. Instead of our live labor employing inert capital, the materials and buildings and money that we work with and within, lifeless capital seems to end up controlling or employing us out of the need to keep reproducing and acquiring more of itself. Then, there's the contradiction between this inversion and the way it appears to us when we make a wage contract to work at some job, say. In that moment, it appears as if I'm totally free an equal agent able to choose my destiny. It doesn't feel at all like I'm submitting to a relation that ultimately sees me as less than I appear to be. Another isolated piece of capital, acquired to move other pieces of capital, and in turn to be moved myself. Ideology is that feeling, the idea that there is no duplicity. What you see is what you get. What ideology does is invert the inversion so that it appears upright. We can look at how this plays out in some of the same ways that Bacon looks at superstition. In his essay, he describes what seemed to him to be some of the reasons people are drawn into superstition. The causes of superstition are pleasing and sensual rites and ceremonies, excess of outward and pharisaical holiness, overgreat reverence of traditions, the favoring too much of good intentions, which openeth the gate to conceits and novelties, the taking an aim at divine matters by human, which cannot but breed mixture of imaginations. Pleasing and sensual rites and ceremonies can no doubt be applied to the pleasure of endless consumption that capitalism demands and celebrates. Rituals like Black Friday and Christmas and the way in which togetherness and solidarity is mediated primarily through products and the purchase of them. Excess of outward and pharisaical holiness brings to mind the moral code produced by the way things are. This kind of thinking sits on a high horse when it considers, say, the poor on welfare, the disabled, the oppressed who don't somehow pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Having an overgreat reverence of traditions suggests that superstition and ideology are naturally conservative opposed to ideas that are critical of the appearance that ideology provides. Under ideology, even many who claim to be progressive would still never think of overturning the fundamental system. 
favoring too much of good intentions can describe the myths ideology spins about those in power whom we admire, whose philanthropy, even if goodwilled, may in the end amount to shuffling capital for gain, or the young startups who claim they will change the world while unwittingly perpetuating the cycle. Finally, the way ideology elevates the way things are to a cosmic level could fit Bacon's idea of taking an aim at divine matters by human ones. Ideology erases the fact that things haven't always been this way. It tends to mystify its own operations and power relations until the point at which to live day to day is, in some respects, to deposit our faith in them. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of these things are, to some extent, unavoidable. And I'd be the last to say I don't enjoy consuming and spending and, yes, sometimes even selling my labor. But what bears examination here is precisely the way this system avoids being examined by becoming preeminently natural. The result of ideology is a mixture of imaginations, a contradictory movement of day-to-day -day thought within a contradictory system of day-to-day -day assumptions about the function, meaning, and truth of a social and economic structure, the workings of which carry in them a duplicity that, as Eagleton puts it, cannot help presenting itself to our consciousness in ways askew to what it actually is.